And with that, I will turn it over to him. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is our 21st ECHO. When it was first started, we had uh, three dead in the U.S. and we just passed 200. So I'm just going to go over, uh, briefly go over our, the state data. And just, if you're interested, I've been using the Nevada government uh, website, but if you go to the Nevada Independent, which is a uh, web-based uh, news organization, they have some remarkable breakdown and more detail on uh, our statistics, actually looking at some of the individual counties and stuff. So if you want to really dig in deep, uh, they're really a very nice site. And so I'm going to show you some of their slides today. So this is the COVID case reports, seven-day average going on. We had the first, the outbreak, and then we went into quarantine here. And then uh, Memorial Day came along and uh, everything went crazy. We were up to about a thousand cases a day. We had some uh, lockdown put down, reintroduced, and then uh, what holiday was this? Was this Labor Day? Came along and now we've had a doubling in the, uh, in the number of cases per, uh, uh, per day up to about from about 200 statewide to about 400. And you know how we always, in Northern Nevada, we look down on uh, Southern Nevada, but unfortunately we are now here in Washaw, we're leading the pack in terms of cases per 100,000. Uh, just a remarkable, almost doubling in the last uh, two weeks or so. And a lot of it appears to be uh, uh, kids at UNR since UNR just opened up a few, uh, few weeks ago. And uh, it, Predominant group that's getting infected are the uh, uh, young people, 18 to 24. Next slide. And so our positivity rate, where you want to have the lower, th this is the seven day moving average. You want to make it so that uh, only a few people per every hundred are, are uh, positive, showing that you're picking up more, most of the cases. This is at the beginning when we didn't have enough testing and then the lockdown, we were doing extremely well. Uh, when the lockdown was somewhat released, the percentage went up to about 16%, which means that you're not, you're probably missing quite a few cases and then we started bringing it down. And now we're leveling out and going up again. Maybe Dr. Pandori may wanna comment on that, but uh, we're really on a, a wild swing here. And then, uh, next slide. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Pandori. Please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I just said if you wanted to comment on, on anything about on these statistics. No, I, uh, not at this point, no thanks. Okay. okay, next slide. And so hospitalizations, uh, we peaked over the summer, at about 11 to 1200 cases. And so far uh, we've had a nice decline. We're leveling out at about four to 500 cases. Uh, so it seems, I mean, this sort of reflects the fact that a lot of our new cases are in healthy young kids that are uh, mostly asymptomatic, uh, but the risk is that they're going to go home and uh, spread it to their family and uh, their uh, parents and their grandparents. And so whether other facilities, other states where they've had school starting about a month earlier, they've seen this and then they start seeing as the second wave as goes from the young kids to their parents and parents and more people are ending up in the hospital. But right now we're doing pretty good on hospitalization. Next. And this is our deaths. Again, we had about five to 10 deaths uh, during the quarantine. Then May came along, May 30th, we had uh, the onset of more cases. And then about four weeks later, you start seeing the increasing number of deaths because they have to get infected and then they get sick, they spend a week or two in the hospital before passing away. So we really peaked out at about uh, 20 deaths uh, per day in uh, Nevada and it's continued to decrease. Again, if we figure that uh, Labor Day was about here, if this is going to be start rolling into the older population, we may start seeing uh, the number of deaths go up at, at some point. So we have this new wave among young people. And look, this is interesting because this is that coronavirus deaths per capita. So it corrects by over 100,000. So how many people are dying per 100,000? And again, Clark County has the most deaths, but even some of these small, smaller uh, rural communities, there, Bernard County has 
significant number of deaths. So it's it's really not just uh, Clark and Washaw that we, we're seeing people pass away, but we are having some significant number of deaths in some of our more rural rural communities uh, when you adjust for uh, uh, rates of death. And so uh, Dr. Siddiqui is gonna present our interesting case of the week. Um, hi everybody, this is Faisal Siddiqui. Um, so, um, a few days ago, I came across a um, young guy. I mean, he's relatively young, he was 55. Uh, Dr. Riddle will say he's definitely very young, but um, so he came in with a history of uh, um, having some purplish discoloration in his hands that started about uh, a week ago before presentation. Um, so he was saying that uh, he was uh, noticing these uh, dots on his um, um, uh, just distal phalanges of his um, uh, arm, off of his hands, and then he was um, concerned about it. But then over the next day or so, they become a little bit more painful, become big, and they started having reddening, uh, redness around uh, the distal phalanx that basically ex uh, extended down to his middle phalanx. Um, so he came into the emergency department, and they were very swollen, and he has tight skin. Um, uh, on his uh, fingers, and he was was not even able to uh, to flex his his um, hands at that point in time. Um, so um, they called me. I think uh, the night of his admission, I was at home. I didn't really see him that night, and I asked him different questions um, to the to the attending physician, and he said, "Oh, by the way, his cycle threshold was 15," and um, and he was completely asymptomatic apart from just these lesions on his hands. Um, so um, I saw him next day and I took pictures of this. Um, and so this is a case of, uh, of what we call as chill banes. Uh, it's a pretty interesting condition that has been associated with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, infection. And um, um, I don't know if anybody have seen the cases of burger disease or thrombangitis obliterant. So this is basically uh, distal vasculature, especially the distal arteries. Uh, you start seeing a lot of um, lymphocytic or plasmacytic infiltrates uh, that in, then those infiltrates basically obliterate uh, the arterial blood supply and because these uh, uh, lesions and um, it's pretty characteristic uh, finding. There have been a lot of case reports of, of chill banes um, uh, being a cutaneous manifestation of uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, but saying that, you need to re also realize that uh, this is not by any stretch of imagination pathognomonic for uh, COVID-19. If this is present, does not really mean that the patient has COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, for example, in, in Belgium, they looked at 31 patients uh, who presented to dermatology clinic with similar conditions, and they did ran uh, COVID-19 tests on all of them just because everybody knew that they are presenting with these complaints, and they found um, um, they did not find COVID-19 in them. So. Uh, saying that, I would say definitely it it, it is definitely a, a clinical manifestation of uh, COVID-19, but certainly not pathognomonic and stuff. Most commonly, most common cutaneous manifestation of COVID-19 is, is just a viral exanthema uh, or, or a morbilliform rash um, that is, you know, um, common with other uh, viral uh, illnesses. And, and that is the most, I think there's a nice article published in, in Cleveland Journal um, that actually shows that um, incidence. Uh, but so far, let me just be very clear, there is nothing that is 100% pathognomonic of COVID-19 or uh, any skin manifestation that tells you that the patient is going to get sick uh, for COVID-19. But I thought it was an interesting case and I would like to share it with you. If somebody has interesting cutaneous manifestations of COVID-19, please reach out to us and, um, and, and we'll discuss those cases too. So Dr. Siddiqui, a question here from, from Alice asking how the disease progress after this? Okay, so most commonly, these uh, they are self-resolving. Fortunately, they do not cause necrosis. They do not really lead to any permanent damage and stuff, and they usually resolve in 10 days. Uh, most people say that you actually just put hydrocortisone cream on it, uh, but since this guy's cycle threshold was very low and there were other inflammatory markers that were high, and also given the fact that this is also an inflammatory condition that is just obliterating the blood supply, I was thinking of giving him some oral decadron too. Um, if this guy was admitted for any other reason, I, even if his D-dimers were normal, 
probably would have also considered giving him uh, full dose anticoagulation. Um, but I would not really send a patient home on anticoagulation just because of these uh, things. Most commonly, they actually self-resolve in about 10 days. Good question. Yeah, thanks for sharing that case with us today, Dr. Siddiqui and Dr. Krasner. Thanks for sharing those updates. Um, any other questions from the group right now? Feel free to unmute yourselves or write in through the chat box. Uh, anything found in lymph nodes? Any inflammation? Um, I did not um, see any lymph nodes being um, uh, swollen or anything in his uh, arms or any other place. All righty, thank you. Uh, so we'll turn it over now to Dr. Riddle. Great, um, thank you. Um, that is an interesting case. Um, we are learning so much about this, this disease um, as we're focusing microscopes in many different directions. Um, can, you, can everybody hear me okay? Just make sure, do it. Yeah. All right, so um, I really appreciate the invitation to kind of share uh, uh, some information on uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Um, just as a background, so you know who I, you know, where I come from, I spent uh, uh, about 15 years um, in the Department of Defense um, developing novel vaccines, um, mainly around enteric infections, um, and so have, have worked in, in, in vaccinology most of my career um, and uh, find it very fascinating, always learning about vaccines, and certainly um, this is an exciting time to be learning about vaccines, uh, what's possible, uh, uh, what's, what's doable, what's new, and, and a lot of the unknowns. Um, so so I, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm by no means the world's expert, but, um, but uh, the, these, are, these are my thoughts about how I'm hearing things and, and seeing things. So I want to focus on a few questions that you see here. How do you develop a vaccine? How do you do one quickly? A uh, little bit about what the current vaccine pipeline is, uh, who may get the vaccine and who may not get the vaccine. So that's the focus. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with vaccine development uh, and it uh, goes through uh, multiple phases um, that initially you try to understand the pathogenesis of the disease and then you develop uh, different uh, targets or strategies for the vaccines. You do a lot of research in animals and in, uh, in vitro uh, uh, work to understand uh, mechanisms and safety and things like that. And then you introduce it into a first in human study where you start looking at, is it safe? Uh, what, what, is the, what may be a good dose to uh, induce a good immune response? Uh, and then you advance it to phase two where you start looking at it in terms of uh, people preventing disease, and then the large phase three studies where you're actually looking at it in real world and, and looking at larger safety data sets uh, to, to understand both safety and efficacy. In, in parallel, you see above this graphic, you see this, uh, um, the, the manufacturing from going from small research lots to then scaling up to commercial to validating, you know, multiple runs. And, and so this is in general kind of a schematic of, of how you develop vaccines. So, but it's, our current processes take way too long. So this is a, um, a graphic that shows uh, historically uh, the, the vaccines that have been developed and licensed over the past, you know, 100 plus years. And uh, some vaccines, for example, for malaria, uh, are still not developed, uh, yet we've been working on them for a century or more. Um, on average, if you take a vaccine that um, meets its phase one target, you know, it looks good and it's first in human, it, it, you know, 12 years to get it to licensure. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of the, the historical. So obviously we're trying to figure out how to do this much more quickly. 
And one might say, okay, well, but in a pandemic, you can really, you know, uh, do much better. Uh, in fact, you know, here's some uh, graphics for prior pandemics uh, and going all the way back to, to polio, um, showing that the vaccine development timelines, even during pandemic, for pandemic infections, uh, still is uh, in, in the range of years. And so, you know, how are we, how are we going to do this in 12 to 18 months uh, is, a, is, a, is a relevant question. So again, how do you do it quickly? Um, in, in, in four parts or three parts, it's taking more and different shots on the goal. So, and I'm gonna talk about each of these uh, compressing the, uh, the, 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 the clinical phase footprint and manufacturing uh, at risk and, and smartly. Um, and again, understanding that this is all being done with no, uh, no sacrifice in our, our, safe, our stringent safety assessments that really across all the phases and, and even in the preclinical work that you're doing, you're, you're looking for safety signals that you may find uh, as you move into the clinic. So, um, so, so as you see on the, that top graphic that I showed before, on the, on the bottom graphic, you see this compression of the um, identification early, uh, you know, multiple target developments, getting into the clinic, um, compressing that, and at, in parallel, doing um, manufacturing process development and scale up. And so that's, in a nutshell, that's how you do it. But I wanna spend a little bit more time uh, talking about specifically the, each of these areas. Um, so compressing the vaccine development schedule, more and different shots on goal. So vaccines, uh, all the vaccine data history that we've had, there's only about a 6% probability of success for a given vaccine that's developed and enters into a phase one only only six percent of those actually make it all the way through. So there are a lot of failed vaccines out there, and I know because I've worked on a lot of vaccines that has not made it out of phase two. Um, and so it's uh, it's more often than not that you're you're not getting a vaccine passing phase one. Um, so th the way you deal with that is you just take more shots on goal, and you 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 develop or you support multiple different strategies. So uh, attenuated, you know, virus-like particles, uh, you know, nucleic acid vaccines, protein subunit, you, you just kind of throw the kitchen sink at the various types of design to really get more shots on goal. And this is uh, uh, updated a couple days ago, but shows how many vaccines are um, in the different pipelines. Um, where there are 11 in, in phase three and five of these are approved for early or limited use, but not in the United States. These are uh, uh, Russian vaccines and uh, Chinese vaccines. Here's another nice uh, tool that I found that really kind of lays out the pipeline if you're interested in kind of getting most up to date. And it shows the, each of these vaccines, the phases that they're in and um, the, 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 the vaccine type. So again, Taking multiple shots on goal, knowing that there's a high probability of failure uh, is hopefully going to get us to a vaccine that, that, that um, hits the mark. So I want to get a little bit deep into the vaccinology and the immunology around vaccines because I, it's, it's pretty important now because we have some really novel platforms that are being advanced. And, and, uh, and so I want to first kind of focus on what traditional vaccines uh, are usually look like, and, and there are some vaccines that are using these traditional vaccine approaches um, that are, are in, in the pipeline. Um, so the subunit vaccines are, are, are highly, I mean, you think about hepatitis B, hepatitis A, these, um, uh, these refined proteins that you uh, develop and then you uh, immunize with and your body develops uh, uh, B cell responses to those and has has um, what we call humoral immunity that's generated by B cells and so there's a lot of vaccines that take this recombinant approach. Um, they're they're um, they're good because we have a good track record with them. Um, there are systems to manufacture them, so they usually take you know cell cultures where you're having to grow these things in yeast or insect cells or what what have you, and then you and then you refine them and and so you, the, the the pathway for them are good. 
the um, the limitation though is that one of the limitations though is that um, they don't last very long um, unless you are boosting them or using special adjuvants and they generally don't produce a very strong cell mediated immunity and I'm going to talk a little bit why that's going to be important I think as we look forward. Um, inactivated virus vaccines, uh, this is where you um, either formalize or, or, or sorolin, or there's different mechanisms where you can basically take the, the vaccine, the, the bug, um, and, you, uh, and, you, and you treat it and you neutralize it so that it can't infect. Again, it's got all those uh, decorations that are on the, on the vaccine. It may be better than the subunit because the subunit is just focusing on the um, the spike protein, yet you know, membrane and envelope proteins may also be important. Um, so an inactivated va virus vaccine may have a broader uh, epitope repertoire that your body um, uh, could potentially develop neutralizing antibodies to. But again, uh, because, it's, it's, um, because of its design, it's not generally uh, generating T cell responses, but rather just B cell humoral responses. So there are other vaccine types that, that, I, that, are, that are more traditional. I'm not going to talk about those, but I, I do want to talk about a couple of the novel ones that are out there um, that are really front runners and, and are going to be um, the first ones to be considered for uh, use, uh, authorization, or licensure. Um, so there's RNA vaccines. Um, these, these are the first ones out of the market. So the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, uh, they entered in the quickest. And, and the reason why is because it's just chemistry. You can manufacture mRNA uh, in, in chemistry. You don't need to grow up cell cultures and, and purify things. It's, it's really a, um, a, a industrial friendly vaccine mechanism. And the idea is that you're using your own cells to kind of uh, uh, make the, uh, the, the particular antigen, in this case, the spike protein. Um, and uh, it, so you inject this usually in, a, in, a, in a, a liposome format so that your cells will uptake it. Uptake It then uh, spills the uh, mRNA into the cell. This, it uses the cell machinery to make the antigens. And then your antigen presenting cells in your body recognize this and mount a response. Now, this, this somewhat mimics a a um, intracellular infection, a viral infection, because it's it's your body sees this as a a, a, um, a foreign invader in one of your cells that are producing non uh, non host proteins, uh, and so in that situation, you not only ramp up your B cell humoral responses, but you ramp up your T cell responses as well, and uh, T cell T cell responses. Um, as we're learning, as we know, and as we learn, are um, critical for uh, these type of intracellular infections. Um, and uh, so it's something that I think that we, we will need to focus on uh, and, and try to see how vaccines uh, can be optimized to produce strong T cell responses. There's a lot of, um, so far, clinical translational data that shows that patients uh, with, with strong T cell responses um, uh, are, are, have less severe disease. In fact, people with more severe disease have more antibodies. And so, you know, it, 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 it suggests that just having a lot of antibodies is not going to um, necessarily prevent severe disease. Um, it's possible that in a, a high humoral immune response vaccine could prevent the initial infection and maybe that's, you know, and, and produce sterile immunity. But more and more, uh, and the field is, is, is focusing on, on, on identifying that T cell response, which is likely to be uh, important for these vaccines. So those are RNA vaccines. Now the downside of that is that they're very unstable. So like the Moderna vaccine, it has to be kept at like minus 94 degrees. And if you think about the challenges of, 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 of distribution of a vaccine with that sort of storage requirement, um, it's, um, in the United States, it's going to be a challenge, but thinking about even global use, it's going to be more of a challenge. Um, so then there's the viral vector vaccine, and that's usually where you take a, a, in this case, adenovirus, and there's a couple of those out there. Actually, the Soviet vaccine or the Russian vaccine uses a, a, an adenovirus uh, vector. And basically, you're taking these adenoviruses that can infect humans, they don't cause disease, and you're putting in the genetic machinery to make that tip protein. 
uh, and then it gets into your cells and it, um, uh, the, the virus can't replicate, but it uses your machinery of, your, of the cells to make those proteins. And again, your, your response is more of a B cell and T cell response. Um, so these are a little bit more stable um, uh, than the RNA vaccines um, and, um, and a little bit harder to produce. But again, those are the second vaccines that are, that are kind of coming out of the pipe. I will say for both of these though, not, neither of these have been in a licensed vaccine, have never been marketed in the United States. And so they are, are novel, but there is a lot of safety experience with them. And so I think that they are, are rational strategies and, um, uh, and, and important. Um, so compressing the vaccine development footprint. This is just an example of the Moderna vaccine, how they've done things in parallel, right? So the phase one, phase two, phase three are all overlapping. Normally, these are all sequential. And so what you're, what you're seeing is in order to compress the footprint, you're, you're doing that initial phase one, you're getting very early safety data on that, like seven days, 30 days after, and then you're saying, okay, let's go into the phase two. And the phase two, you're actually, it's a phase two, three, it can be a phase two, three combination where you're working out some of the outcomes in the phase two to be used in the phase three. Um, and so there's significant overlap with that. Um, and the, you're, you're doing this also because you have uh, large clinical trials networks like the, the uh, COVPN. Um, you're, you have regulatory agencies that are working hand in hand with the government and with the industry partners. Uh, and, and experts in the field to come up with standardized protocols, standardized outcomes. And so through all of these efforts, uh, there, there is a, um, the ability to accelerate and kind of uh, in parallel do these phase studies. There is some talk, one of the other things that, that, that I've done before are human challenge studies. And because it's hard to you know, design studies to look at efficacy, they usually have to be really, really large. Um, for a number of diseases like malaria, like enteric infections, in fact, like flu uh, and dengue fever, there are human challenge studies where you can put these vaccines into, um, you know, you can give a group the vaccine, a group of placebo, and then challenge them with the uh, infectious agent and, and see if the vaccine works. Those are being talked about. Um, I think there's a lot of concern with those uh, in, uh, given that there is such a varied outcome we don't fully understand the pathogenesis, and so it's it, it's quite um, it, it's quite risky to do human challenge studies. But there are people that are are looking at attenuating it and trying to do these things. So that brings us to a little bit of work that we're doing. So our VA was selected to be one of the um, phase three sites for the uh, Janssen uh, Johnson and Johnson uh, adenovirus vector uh, vaccine uh, that will be starting. Uh, hopefully by the end of this month at the VA. Um, this, is a, uh, this is one of, of nearly 300 sites, uh, 60,000 people, one-to-one um, -one vaccine placebo. The important thing about this vaccine is that it's a single dose vaccine. So the other vaccines I've talked about are all two doses. This is a single dose vaccine. Um, the other thing that this is unique in this study is that it's looking at uh, moderate to severe COVID infection, whereas the mRNA viruses of Moderna and Pfizer, their endpoints are just, not just, but endpoints are uh, COVID, symptomatic COVID disease, not severe disease. And so, you know, it's, it's unknown. They will have the data on severe disease, but their endpoints uh, are, not, um, are not moderate to severe. It's just any COVID uh, disease. Uh, so we'll be vaccinating, our, our site will be vaccinating about a thousand uh, veterans uh, and VA employees, and then we'll be following them up for two years to look at both safety and efficacy. Um, so the next way to, to do this is compressing the vaccine schedule, making, and you've seen this, so um, usually you don't start building that manufacturing plant until you have uh, uh, had your phase three results and you know that you're, you know, you're ready to go and you have good results. Um, whereas now we're just manufacturing vaccine. Uh, we're making large lots of vaccine independent of the phase. And so the idea is that if, if one of these vaccines works, there will be a stockpile of that vaccine to start using immediately. Um, 
there you you there's also it, it's this is a separate topic all in of itself but the developing platforms what what has happened is multiple different platforms for uh, uh, expression, um, uh, viral uh, viral growth, uh, uh, culture. They're done in parallel. So you're doing like just a big heavy look at process development, so that you can take these small research grade and 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 manufacture at scale very early on. So so that's another area. And then it's exciting, this uh, Texas A&M Center for Innovation and Advanced Development Manufacturing is using modular technology. So usually when you have a vaccine, you are building a unique plant that just does this vaccine, and that's all it does. Well, there are, there is, there's modern and modular technology that allows you to kind of plug and play and use a facility to uh, make multiple different vaccines. And so... Um, the, uh, the U.S. government uh, and, and industry has partnered with this academic center at Texas A&M to be able to modularize uh, and accelerate um, vaccine production. But what we're worried about, and this is a graphic, it's not very good, but this is a grainy graphic that says that, you know, the estimates of the H1N1 vaccine in 2009 were uh, nearly 5 million, but actually because of the manufacturing processes, uh, the, the, it was only about 1 million. And so um, this just goes to show that while you think about the capacity to manufacture vaccines, um, it doesn't always go that well. Um, and so again, by, by taking a lot of risk in terms of not safety, but in throwing a lot of money at different processes and, 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 um, and these strategies of, of rapid scale up to large lots as soon as possible, you're uh, obviating this risk of not having enough vaccine at the end of the day. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the types of immunity because we don't know. So ideally you'd like to get every vaccine to have this sterile immunity. So meaning that you got the vaccine, you get exposed to SARS-CoV-2 virus, it doesn't take hold. You, you have sterile immunity. But what we're likely to look at are vaccines that Maybe they, they allow you to get colonized, but you don't get sick. And so that would be good, right? Because you're not getting sick, but that's not going to stop the transmission, right? You're still going to have people who are carrying the virus and, and, and potentially spreading it to others. And so it's going to still require kind of uh, physical distancing and mask wearing. Um, maybe maybe it, you don't get really sick by it. You just get a mild illness. That's good too. You know, I think these are all acceptable outcomes. Um, does the vaccine reduce the infectiousness? So yeah, maybe you get it, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't transmit to others. Um, and then ultimately, is there a vaccine that induces herd immunity, which is more of a population effect of the vaccine being in enough people and reducing the infectiousness of that uh, vaccine? So that's the world that you're, the types of immunity that we may be seeing, um, and we don't know yet. But there's a lot of questions. So will it work against severe disease? Again, the Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines have an endpoint of symptomatic disease, confirmed symptomatic disease. Is that severe disease? Um, how long will the protection last? Um, will it work in subgroups? Uh, and will it work in diverse populations? And there's a lot of effort to expand. Uh, for example, I think it was Pfizer or AstraZeneca uh, bumped up their vaccine from 30,000 to 45,000 to start including more diverse populations of age, uh, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, and, and comorbidities. And then what about the protection from chronic illness? Um, do, does it, will it work for that? So kind of parallel to that, one of the things we're doing at UNR in collaboration with Renown is we're doing a convalescent COVID longitudinal study where we started it a, um, a few months ago. And we're basically uh, taking individuals that um, have recovered from uh, uh, COVID, um, we're, we're doing some screening to kind of help them to maybe donate plasma if, if, the, if that's needed. Um, but we're also using it to evaluate their immune response dynamics over time and start to catalog some of these long-term health effects. Um, through this study, we're going to be able to explore people who have are long haulers or have these chronic persistent symptoms what is their bio underlying biology? What is their proteomic profile or, or uh, exposome or you know, what metabolomic profile that may explain why somebody has chronic 
conditions from this and not. And the, and the question is, will the, is the vaccine going to be able to um, have any impact on these long-term infections? And so uh, this is a study that's underway that we're um, very excited to be doing with Renown and, and uh, we'll continue to um, report out on that. Okay, shifting gears. So who, who's gonna get the vaccine? Um, there's a lot of discuss. The National Academy of Medicine uh, has, has, has put out a, uh, a draft guidance on that. The Centers for Disease Control is, is clearly involved. The ACIP is involved. And this is, in fact, a, a, a slide from one of the decks of the ACIP meeting where they're talking about the, um, uh, the phases of distribution. Uh, first starting off, phase 1A is healthcare personnel. Uh, and then uh, essential health workers, high people with high risk medical conditions, adults 65s and over. But on the graphic here, you see that when these vaccines initially get approved, you know they're 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 in the millions of doses. But you know we have some of them require two doses. You know we have a 300 plus million population, so there are going to be shortages for high risk populations that we where we need to roll out vaccines, and so there's. I think we're heading into a, um, a, a real challenge uh, in how we're going to equitably distribute a uh, constrained vaccine to multiple groups that need it. Eventually production will ramp up and we'll have plenty of vaccine and that will meet, meet supply and demand. So I don't have any smart answers on this. I think this is what to watch is, is how, how, the, how the dialogue goes and how, uh, how we um, vaccinate uh, out of the gate. But this is, the, this is the issue though. So this is a graphic um, showing the, these various populations, you know, essential workers, healthcare personnel, adults over 35, high risk medical conditions. Some of that overlaps, but you're talking about, you know, hundreds of millions of people that qualify for, uh, would be qualifying for a vaccine, but, but not having enough vaccine to do all of them. Yet they're all, they all have been identified. So again, the issue of how that's going to happen. Um, and uh, this is from the National Academy, this tiered approach, um, talking about health coworkers and full responders, uh, people with underlying conditions, moving on to essential service workers. Uh, and then the last phases are young adults and children, um, and then you know, all remaining residents. So this is a, this is a big issue. I, I, I think it's just something that we all see. Um, it'll be interesting to watch how this um, progresses. So who may not get the vaccine? Well, um, there. I just had a conversation with one of the uh, one of the people in our in our convalescent study, and 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 this gentleman was uh, uh, you know coming in because he he wanted to help science out. He wanted to you know help us learn and donate plasma and things like that. But when I asked him about well, what about these vaccines that are coming out? And he's like. I don't know. I, 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 I'm probably not going to get it. I'm probably going to wait. And I said, well, do you get your flu shot every year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get my flu shot. Do you have all your other vaccines? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, and so, you know, there's a whole population of people that ha are, are vaccine supportive, but not this one. Um, and so this is this. That was one person. But this was actually a poll that was done about a month ago by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And that's the question it asks, you know, would you want to get vaccinated? Would you not want to get vaccinated? And uh, only 42% uh, wanted to get, would get a vaccination. So clearly that's going to be a challenge if we're not able to get people vaccinated um, with an effective vaccine. Um, it's interesting. There are statistics on physicians and healthcare workers. It's not quite 42%. But it's in the double digits, you know, 20% range of healthcare workers not wanting to get a vaccine. Uh, um, and so this is a problem. Um, we're, you know, what's behind this? Um, clearly, there's a, there's a vaccine skepticism, uh, a hesitancy uh, population about vaccines. Those are going to be hard to reach. Um, but there are, there are other factors, and, and this is a paper that I found interesting in terms of looking at the psychological roots of anti-vaccination attitudes. And these are the four things, conspiratorial beliefs, uh, individualism versus hierarchy, worldview, um, disgust, like not wanting needles, and then reactance, which is basically 
you know, don't tell me what to do. I, you know, I, it's, I, it's, it's, uh, um, not wanting to, to, to do something that's, that's they're being asked to do. And these were even more important than demographics, education, or political affiliation. So if you're interested in that, I think that's a good, that's a good paper. Um, what we're doing here at UNR um, is that we recognize that, and, and we're, we're collaborating, we're working with, the, uh, with Healthy Nevada or the immunization program um, and the state health department, and we're, we've just submitted a protocol where we're going to be measuring over time the uh, attitudes by providers as well as the citizen population about attitudes specifically towards these novel vaccines that are coming out. And our plan is to, to um, do this serially, cross-sectionally, uh, and then provide this information to policymakers, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to community advocates, to as many people who are, are willing to see this information, to try to help shape the message so that we get the best information out there and we address the concerns that are being raised in our population and um, really sh shape messaging. And so this is, this is just getting started. Um, we're excited to contribute to this. You will all probably have, uh, through the outreach, uh, an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to complete the survey. And we, we ask that, that, you know, that, that, that you do and that, and that you um, uh, learn as much as you can about these vaccines because at the end of the day, one of the things that's shown to really affect whether people get vaccines is whether their healthcare provider recommends that vaccine. And so you are all part of this, uh, of this solution. And, and so um, I look forward to, to learning more and, and, and working with you all on this. Uh, moving on to uh, what's been a lot in the news lately um, is, well, how is this vaccine going to get licensed or, or approved or authorized? Uh, there's, there's three ways to get a product like this. One is through just the regular FDA approval pro process. One is through the um, uh, emergency use authorization. And then, and then one is through this um, you know, expanded use, expanded access program. Um, nobody's talking about the expanded access program. People are talking about full FDA approval versus emergency use authorization. Um, this has been done already, um, and it's been somewhat controversial for uh, uh, convalescent plasma uh, and, uh, and, and remdesivir. Um, it's, it, there's, this is the quickest way to get to the use of the vaccine. And I just wanted to kind of give you an overview because I didn't realize this. I learned a lot about the emergency use authorization is that any of the kind of the high-level secretaries of the of these branches, of DHS, HHS, or, or the DOD, can make a determination of an emergency, um, and then that all goes to the HHS secretary, who then declares and says, "Yes, this is an emergency," uh, and then a company with a product um, uh, submits a request to have a product, in this case, a vaccine authorized that goes to the FDA commissioner with consultation from various groups depending on what it, what it is um, and the, it's the FDA commissioner that um, issues this emergency use and these are the criteria so um, it, it needs to be a a declared emergency a serious life-threatening disease evidence of effectiveness based on the totality of the scientific evidence uh, known potential benefits outweigh the known potential risks, and there's no adequate approved and available alternative. So theoretically, you know, this, the FDA commissioner can, can approve this, um, uh, um, but what's, what I'm seeing happening and I, what, what we all hope is happening is that there are going to be independent advisory committees to the FDA. The ACIP is looking at this and uh, making recommendations, and there's transparency. So everybody is seeing the safety data. It's, it's, not, it's not behind walls, uh, and so we are aware of, aware of everybody is aware of that. Um, you know, we, we, we are, one, is, one could be concerned that um, the FDA commissioner independently improve, uh, approves this, but I think you will see, and I hope you will see, and I, I expect that we would see, is that there would be a lot of um, dialogue and transparency 
and people within the FDA, within these bodies that are reviewing the data, stating if, if, if something gets authorized that pe these people don't agree with, they're going to say it. And in the end, nobody's going to take a vaccine if these other groups are saying, no, we, we don't agree with this. And so I, I feel that if we get to this point of an emergency use authorization, um, that it will have been appropriately vetted um, and and be and meet these meet these criteria. Now it's important to know that no vaccine is completely 100% effective and no vaccine is completely 100% safe either. And so we need there'll there'll be a balance with that. And um, it's just we need we'll need to have the data. The public will need to have the data. The healthcare workers will need to the the providers, the recommenders, the pharmacists. All of us will need to feel confident. Uh, and and I feel that 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 there are processes being put in place to do that. Um, despite what's been done so far with uh, EUAs uh, for other um, therapeutics. So um, I wanna kind of recap uh, and, and, and allow time for, for discussion here. Um, uh, there's, what we know is that there's multiple vaccine strategies are under development. Um, uh, that we know that the process for the EUA approval must be done with transparency as well as understand that we're not gonna have like the year follow-up safety data. You know, we're, we're gonna have short-term safety and that's pretty good. But we're, we're not gonna know, you know, these vaccines, what are the long, if there are long-term health effects, but there are systems in place right now. Uh, industry, industry wants to get this right, right? No industry wants to have a vaccine that's gonna be uh, causing more harm than good. And so they have a vested interest the FDA certainly has an invested interest. Um, uh, healthcare providers, we have a vested interest um, to, to, to get this right. Um, but we're, we can't wait for a year to get all the safety data to then make a decision. We have to, we have to move forward with what we have. Um, but the systems we put in place to look at those signals on an ongoing basis and make adjustments as, as needed. Um, vaccine distribution systems will be challenged. So the the um, the Moderna vaccine uh, it comes in lots of like 975 doses and and multi dose vials. So when we're talking about a big city, that's probably okay. But if you're talking about a rural area, they're going to have to accept a big lot of vaccine. And how are you going to do that? Because if you split it out, you got to keep it all. It's it's the distribution is going to be a challenge. I know there are smart minds working on that, but that's going to be interesting to watch. Um, and I think we know that vaccine uptake is not likely to be as high as desired, and, and we're going to have to live with that. And so we're going to have to live with continued physical distancing and, uh, and, and mask wearing quite some time, uh, even with the vaccine. Um, what we don't know is the duration and the quality of protection. We don't know how it's going to work in these most vulnerable subgroups. We really don't know about global vaccine supply and delivery. Um, and um, Will vaccines in combination with physical distancing and mass memory be enough to extinguish this uh, pandemic? Um, these are all the unknowns that I look forward to learning with, with you. So I think we also need to recognize that, you know, we're, we're one part of this. Um, we actually need multiple vaccines. It's not gonna be one vaccine. We need as many vaccines that are as safe and as effective as possible to distribute. We're not gonna, you know, these, these cold chain requirements for some of these mRNA vaccines are not, I, having spent a lot of time in Sub-Saharan Africa and around the world, I, I really am challenged in, in how those types of vaccines will be distributed. So we need the killed whole cell vaccines. We need, we need the multiple types of vaccines, the subunit protein vaccines, um, lyophilized vaccines. So yes, we need more vaccines. It's likely going to be multiple vaccines that, that get um, included. And it's going to take vaccinating the world for, for us to really um, get out of this, I think. So I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions or if other people, there's a lot of smart people on this call, if they want to add their observations as well. I, 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 the floor is open. Thank you. Excellent. Great information for us today, Dr. Riddle. Thank you very much. Um, I have seen a couple questions that came in through the chat box. And yeah, we've got some time now for questions. So feel free to keep writing those in. A uh, question from Dr. Siddiqui that was addressed by uh, Dr. Pandori. He asks, uh, is it the viral vector vaccine that caused the transverse myelitis, uh, the AstraZeneca? 
Um, so Dr. Pandori said, yes, it was the adenoviral based vector. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that, that there are, um, there are multiple adenovirus vector vaccines. Um, and so a little bit deeper dive on adenovirus vaccines. Uh, that, there's AD5, which is human. There's AD26, which is also human. There's AD something, which is chimpanzee. Um, and what we know about adenovirus, there's, there's a broad field of research on adenovirus and, and vaccine development. And they, they're not all equal. I mean, they, they, some of them uh, enter the cell differently. Some of them cause different pattern recognition reception uh, and different immune responses. Uh, some of them there's more of a background in the population for and, or, or not. Um, and so um, this, this adenovirus, some of them actually um, uh, use their own machinery to, to make the, the protein or the, the payload that it's trying to, to make. Um, some use the, the cell machinery. So they're not all the same. Um, but in fact, yeah, that is, that is one. And the trial is on hold in the United States, uh, but it's been lifted in Brazil and, and Europe as those regulatory agencies have reviewed the data and have decided to move forward. So, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, these things are important. These are important signals. And I think, I think what I take from this is that we have good surveillance in place to detect these adverse events. Now, how you link it to that vaccine is is the hard part, and um, you know it's it's hard to to detect a symphony out of just one note. You know, so you really have to do do a deeper dive and 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 listen more and learn more and proceed with caution, which is which is exactly what's what's happening. Thanks for that question, Dr. Siddiqui. Um, another question here asking about what evidence exists that novel vaccines are safe and that activated T cells uh, won't cause autoimmune disorders later on? That is an extremely smart question. Um, so there, there, is the, there, is the, there is the risk, right? Because what you're doing is you're um, using your, the machinery of your cells to, um, uh, to, to, to produce this protein and and generate an immune response and there's and there's multiple ways to get to the autoimmunity or the immune immune mediated uh, vaccine associated dysfunction disorders um, it could be mimicry so you know it the, the 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 spike protein looks like some other protein in our body this is what happens with uh, um, uh, like Campylobacter and Guillain Barre um, uh, but that that can be looked at before you you can find homology and sequencing and 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 the protein conformations and look for homology with host proteins and that's been done with this uh, protein uh, the spike protein and so I don't think we're going to see mimicry I think I think what the the question is is a smart one is that um, there's also mechanisms called bystander effect and so you you induce this inflammatory response and your immune system gets confused. And as it's trying to attack that uh, protein or neutralize that protein, it's, so, it's getting confused with your host proteins and directing an antibody response towards that. Um, so there are mechanisms. Right now, in, in all of the safe, and, and again, there are ways to look at that. And, and right now, the, the, the what I've seen is that those types of cellular autoimmune responses are not being seen, but I, you know, that, that is the risk. We, we, we don't fully know that and we need to look out for that. Um, the, um, but that would be the same thing that would apply to um, natural infection likely. Uh, and we don't, well, we probably haven't looked at it, but we don't see how coronaviruses are causing autoimmune disease. That's not been a signal that we've seen so far. You know, we probably haven't looked at it as closely as not, and so um, I think I think it's a legitimate concern. Um, it's it's a legitimate concern actually for every vaccine, though, as well, not just these uh, viral vector and, and mRNA vaccines. Great answer there, thanks, Dr. Riddle. And other questions from the group? Please feel free to unmute yourselves or write in through the chat box. I see there's one from Dr. Pandori, do animal models exist for the coronavirus vaccine? Um, 
And then did anything ever happen with the vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2? So um, no good animal model. Vaccine development is, is hugely uh, benefited by having uh, good animal models that recapitulate disease. Um, there is a rhesus macaque model that is uh, is a disease model where you where where the primates are challenged and they produce a respiratory disease. Um, those are very hard. I mean, they're they're expensive models. They're 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 resource. They're not you know they're just hard studies to do. They're usually small studies. Um, but those studies have shown that. Um, I think it's the the Moderna vaccine. No, I, I can't speak to which vaccine, but there has been vaccines that have been put through that rhesus model uh, and and have shown that it, it works in that. Um, the, and that I think that the SARS CoV two CoV one and the MERS CoV have have gone through those models and, and shown effect. Um, the uh, there are no like rodent models though or mouse models that are are really relevant, and so that's that's a challenge when you don't have a very small animal model. Um, but at the same time, you know, at this point, you want to be, you really want to move towards humans um, when you can, as soon as it's safe. And many vaccines that I've developed over time, we've not had animal models. And so we've not used that as part of our uh, pathway, a critical path to do, we do animal safety studies, but, but efficacy studies are, 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 are not available. The SARS-CoV-1 vaccine, that, that got to a certain point that showed immunogenicity. Uh, it, the, the pandemic petered out before it could show efficacy. Um, but the, one of those vaccines uh, that have been basically just adapted and using the same platform and, and have developed the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So that certainly helped accelerate the, the vaccine development because there was a, a, a sister or a cousin illness that that, that vaccine had been uh, developed for. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for that question, Dr. Pandori. Other questions from the group before we wrap up for today? I just want to add that, and this is goes a little bit deeper, but this this T cell response is is likely to be very important for for this vaccine. So so the the B cell humoral responses is usually short lived. Um, it is associated with more inflammation, and so it could be associated with you know uh, in in human infection. It's it's being shown with more severe disease outcomes, and therefore we need to really look at these vaccines that develop the strong T cell response and CD8 T cell response and memory response. Because generally those, you think about yellow fever, you think about smallpox, those are one shot protected the rest of your life. And I think that's, and those, and, and those are safe vaccines. We need to work towards that type of immunity for this. Um, and the, the, the repertoire, the broadness of that response um, is important. I will say that epidemiologically, I wonder if we're only focusing on the spike protein and there are other envelope and membrane proteins that are important um, and has been shown important with human coronavirus disease and, and animal models, you know, are, is that going to be enough? Is a, is, is a, is a T cell response, uh, robust, you know, prolonged T cell response to the, to the uh, spike protein going to be enough? Um, I think it's, 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 it certainly, we know the mechanism and the binding protein and how it, how it works, um, but um, it's, it's also a limitation, but it's also a challenge to make a vaccine to those multiple epitopes all at once as well. All right, I know we are a little bit over our time here today, so I did send out through the chat box for you all um, the link to our website where you can retrieve Dr. Riddle's slides from today as well as view our upcoming dates the link to claim CME or CEU credit, as well as a link to sign up for our weekly ECHO email list. So if you need to take off, uh, just make sure you take a look at those. Uh, we do have a question here from Linda. What's the latest news on how will the vaccine be distributed? Uh, is there gonna be enough supplies, including needles? Uh, and what's the cost gonna be like as well? Yeah, um, I, there may be people who are on this call that are better uh, position to answer that. Those are the, those are all good questions. Um, um, I've not heard of those distribution issues. What what I have heard about is that even if the um, vaccine is provided for free, 
there are still costs with administration of the vaccine and who's, who's going to pay, pay for those. Um, the, the distribution of the vaccine and the delivery of the vaccine, I know that, I think Nevada, there may be, I know there's some pharmacists on this call, but I, 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 I thought I heard that Nevada was, was positioning itself to allow pharmacists to vaccinate, to, to give vaccines as well. That would certainly open up distribution. Um, but if there's anybody else who knows more about how Nevada is, is, is um, preparing, which I know they are for, for vaccination, please uh, speak. Yeah, anyone on the call today with a little bit more information on this, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Hi, this is Dr. Van Gilder out here in Lovelock. How are you guys? <laughs> Hanging in with this. So there is a vaccine planning committee that's meeting every one to two weeks for the state and there's uh, various people um, involved talking about all of the different things that need to happen in order to make this successful, but they are working out uh, training resources. Uh, they said that they're, um, what they've heard is that all the vaccines for COVID are kind of come with it, it, you know, all the supplies needed to give it. Um, and I'm not sure of the cost. We haven't really heard anything about that. Uh, but they meet every one to two weeks, multiple people talking about how to store everything, where it's going to be stored, how it's going to be distributed, um, all the things that need to be um, talked about and written down for tracking which vaccines were given to whom. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of really great people already on board trying to sort that all out. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Van Gilder.